All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and um, get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. We want to thank you all for joining us today. Today's webinar will be I'm not getting about... audio. This is Dave. Oh. Oh, let's see here. Sorry about that. Dave, can you hear us? I'll go ahead and give Dave a call, and I'll just mute him for now. Right. Thanks, Bree. So today's webinar will be about traditional native foods and brain health. This is our third and final webinar of the American Indian and Alaska Native Resource Center for Brain Health webinar series. Uh, we appreciate all of you who have tuned in for these webinars over the past few months. Um, at this time, we are gonna invite Dave to open us up with a prayer, but we're gonna see if he's gonna be able to connect in. Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Adenato Sigili Gigage Ne Ahani Pia Siwa Nihishki Pia Nigo Pishkeshti Nigo Hila. Oh, great one. We're thankful for. It's uh, Eloheno, Mother Earth. We're grateful for Atsela, the fire of life. Gift us with healing and the ability to be helpers to others as you would have us to be. Key. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. As Brianna said, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. We'd like to get to know everyone who's here today. Um, a little background about IA Squared to get us started. We help people and programs figure out how to competently and effectively access and serve Native American elders. Um, IA Squared works to advance both knowledge and practice and promote engagement at all levels. We acknowledge the history, rights, cultures, and values of Indigenous peoples throughout their lifespans. Responding to the needs of those we serve we generate research, convene key players to identify novel approaches to cross-cutting issues, and we work to bridge the gap between policy, research, and practice. IA Squared is one of three CDC-funded HBI Component B resource centers. So as a resource center, um, we provide technical assistance and resources for tribes, tribal leadership, healthcare, public health staff, urban Indian health centers and organizations, tribal elder service advocates, and a lot more folks across the country. Um, as part of our work, we adapt and develop information products. Um, so our products, they're designed by, and they're designed for American Indian Alaska Native communities. Um, I Squared has taken a diligent effort to involve community members, elders, Title VI, as well as our National Advisory Board in the creation and development of the products that we produce. Uh, next slide, Bree. Um, let's see here. Someone's in. I'm having some technical difficulty. So on the slide, you'll see just some of the products um, that we have available on our website for download as well as available for print. Um, these resources include the Healthy Heart, Healthy Brain flyers and posters, the Healthy Food, Healthy Brain Rat Card series that we're going to touch on a little bit more later, the Dementia Risk Reduction Graphic, as well as the 10 Sides of Thinking or Memory Changes that might be dementia, as well as many others. Um, you can learn more about these on our website at iasquared.org. Um, and we also have more products that will be, re be released very soon. Next slide. Um, now I would like to welcome and introduce today's speaker. Um, Heidi Robertson is a subject matter expert on nutrition and provides training and technical assistance on questions pertaining to the Older Americans Act Title VI nutrition program. Before this role, she worked for a tribal area agency on aging, coordinating congregate and home delivered meal services. She evaluated programs as well as worked at a training senior center staff. 
She has degrees in both nutrition and public health. Um, so a warm welcome to Heidi today. And I'm gonna pass it over to her. Thank you, Marianne, for, um, for the yeah. nice introductions. I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, speaking with everyone today about traditional native foods and brain health, um, both of which are, are so very important and some of my favorite topics to, to talk about. So um, let's go ahead and, and get into the um, presentation, if you could go to the next slide. All right, let's talk a little bit about um, the plan for, for this hour and what we're going to do. So, um, you know, welcome introductions, please, you know, keep, keep introducing yourself in the chat. I'd love to know who you are. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, the brain, what affects brain health, go over, you know, brain health um, prevalence and prevalence of, you know, Alzheimer's dementia in, among tribal elders. We'll talk about just the general recommendations for brain health, and then go into a little bit more about traditional foods and um, what you can do. Then I'll, I'll wrap up with some resources and, and some Q&A at the end. So uh, we've got an action-packed agenda. Hopefully you're, you're um, um, able to take some from, um, from the presentation. And you know I have a, a few places for interactions. I'm looking forward to, to hearing your feedback as well. All right, next slide. So let's get to know each other. You're already introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, I want to know also, you know, what are some of your favorite traditional foods? Um, so let, let us know your name, where you're from, you know, what you do, your favorite traditional foods. What, what do you like to eat? Oh, wild onion soup. It's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> any anything with berries i <laughs> i agree with you there I, I love berries huckleberries blue corn dumplings mutton sandwich green chili wild rice blueberries smoked salmon pad thai green chili soup with potatoes morel mushrooms from kansas oh an okra Wild rice, blueberries, maple syrup. I agree. This is making me hungry too. Um, salmon and acorn soup. Right. So all these, all these foods that you're suggesting are, um, you know, they're really varied. Right. You have um, some sweet berries. You know, you're you're coming in from different parts of of the country, so it's really, you know, interesting to see some of the similarities and differences between the the traditional foods, but you know, uh, everything that you all are saying are very healthy, right? They're, they're whole foods from the ground. They're, they're not overly processed and it all, you know, really contributes to your overall health. Um, so with that, let's go into, oh, tepary beans, uh, delicious. Okay, let's go to the next slide before I, I get too hungry. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk first about the brain, because in order to talk about brain health, right, let's, let's talk about the brain first. So it's, it's a really complex organ. It's, you know, the, the most complex organ of our, our body, and it weighs about three pounds. So it consists of mostly fat, 60% fat, 40% water, protein, carbohydrates, and salts. And then there's blood vessels and nerves in there as well. So basically what it does, the brain sends and receives chemical and electrical signals. So all day your, your brain is sending um, these signals out to your body, telling them to um, do things, to operate in certain ways. And then you're also it's also receiving signals from the body. So, you know, it might receive a signal from the body saying that, oh, my, you know, my cup is hot. You know, that's a signal that my brain will receive from the body. So it consists of, of five lo lobes. Um, you can see them pictured here. There's the frontal lobe, which is more about, you know, personality, decision-making, movement. Um, this frontal lobe, I believe is not, you know, 
fully developed, the prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed until I want to say about 2025. 20, so, um, you know, those, the poor decisions you made as a teenager and early adult, that's, <laughs> that's because of your brain development. Um, and then you have the parietal lobe, which helps you identify objects, understanding spatial relationships, and touch and uh, spoken language. And then there's the occipital lobe, uh, which is in yellow, and that is responsible for your vision. The temporal lobe, which is in green, is short-term memory, speech, musical rhythm, smell recognition, right? So these, these lobes really um, control you know, everything that, that we do in the body, you know, how we think and speak. Um, so just a, a very, very quick synopsis of the brain, but um, we can go on to the next slide. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, diseases of the brain and especially um, dementia, risk factors of dementia. So there's, you know, modifiable risk factors, which are things that uh, you might be might be able to change in your lifestyle. And then non-modifiable non risk factors are just, you know, things that, that we're stuck with that we really can't change, but it's good to be aware of. So looking at the non-modifiable non risk factors first, we have age, right? Risk doubles every five years after age of 65. So you know, as we age, risk of acquiring these, Alzheimer's and related dementias um, are in, is increasing. Not much we can do about that. Just um, we can be the, aware that it's happening and try to work on our health. You know, family history. Um, people are are more likely to acquire dementia if there's someone um, in their family that has also had dementia. So you know, it might be a little bit of a mix between genetics and environment. But for whatever the reason you know, it is um, the way it is. And then sex as well, two thirds of, of the people diagnosed with dementia are women. Um, modifiable risk factors are, um, these are things that, that we might be able to change. And, you know, some of these are much easier to change than others. And so, you know, you might see something that's on the modifiable risk factor list, but it might be, you know, a little more non-modifiable for you. And so that's okay, you know, the, the biggest thing is just to, to focus on those factors that we can really improve that can really make a big difference in our, our health. But, you know, definitely wants you to be aware of, of all of those risk factors. So, you know, education, especially um, of formal education, those that haven't, you know, been to school longer, um, have less risk of dementia, you know, hearing loss is also a, a modifiable risk factor. So, you know, if you are having hearing loss and those hearing aids and um, are, are really a, a great thing that can help you, um, you know, modify that, that risk factor there. Traumatic brain injuries, you know, we always want to prevent them, wear, wear your helmets. Um, if you do have a traumatic brain injury, make sure you go to the doctor and get it, get everything checked out. Um, you know, hypertension, high blood pressure is is a big risk factor. So is alcohol use, um, obesity. So obesity is a, a BMI over thirty. And I put a link here um, for you to be able to to click on an obesity calculator so you can you can find out you know what your um, BMI is. So yeah. put that in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's very helpful. And, you know, with um, obesity and, and BMI, right, it's, it, it might vary a little bit um, per person, but it's really good to kind of be aware of you, where you are, what, what your BMI is, if you're in that, you know, normal weight, overweight, or obese category. And especially if you change categories, so if you've always been, um, you know, in the normal weight, and then all of a sudden you're you're in the overweight BMI, you know, changes like that are really good to be aware of. As sm smoking, as well as is a big risk factor. You know, it's difficult to do, but 
Um, <laughs> but quitting smoking can, is uh, great for your health for so many different thing, reasons. Um, you know, depression as well and social isolation. The Surgeon General just put out a report saying that you know, social isolation is as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So, you know, it's, it's a really uh, a big deal and it really does affect your health in, in a huge way. You know, physical, physical inactivity. So getting up and, and moving as best you can, um, you know, it might be walking, you know, farther in your car in the parking lot or taking the stairs or, um, you know, doing some exercises as, as you're watching TV can, can be a great way to sort of, int, you know, start doing some physical activity if you haven't been doing it already or if you've been having a really hard time fitting it into your schedule and um you know and then if you can do longer physical activities um sessions you know 30 minutes a day whatnot that's that would be really great i know ia square has a, a rat card on um, physical activity guidelines and and getting started with that so um that would be a, a great resource for you um, diabetes as well, having diabetes is a risk factor for getting dementia. And then, you know, air, air pollution, which sometimes it's modifiable is also not modifiable, right? You're, you're kind of in the environment that you're in, um, but you can just take steps to make sure that you're um, not going outside if the air quality is bad or, um, you know, steps like that can, can really make a difference because you know, modifiable risk factors cause 40% uh, of dementia cases. So there, that really shows that there's a whole lot that can be done to uh, improve the risk, your risk of dementia, um, your family's risk of dementia. We did have a question in the chat. Since we're on the modifiable risk factors, um, Melissa asks, with recent articles coming out showing that BMI is regulated to primarily white males who lived 50 plus years ago, what alterations do you suggest when working in clinics um, like theirs with primarily a Native uh, patient population? Yeah, so, you know, BMI is, is not perfect. Um, by any means, it's really not not a perfect indicator of um, someone's health, but it is you know a piece of of that puzzle. So um, you know we have have BMI. Um, what some of the great things about it is that you know it's it's easy to implement. You only need a couple factors, right? The person's you know weight, height, um, age. Um, so simple things that you're easy that are easy to get that, that people know, uh, you know, off the top of their head can give you this BMI gauge. But you know, definitely if if people are athletes, if they have you know larger bone compositions, it's not always the most accurate for you know assessing um, their body fat composition. So it's it's something that you that is helpful and it's a good tool for the tool your toolbox but we know it's not perfect. Um, there are different, especially, you know, in clinics uh, settings, there's, you can get, you know, one of those um, fat, uh, gosh, I'm blanking on the terms now, but, you know, they can read your, your fat composition. So there's, there's handheld ones that you can get. There's also one um, that really kind of measure your, um, your upper body. And then there's ones that are, are built into the scale um, that really kind of measures your, your lower half, that composition of the lower half. So, um, you know, something like that in a cl clinic setting could be really helpful for um, looking at someone's fat composition. BMI, right, is, is definitely not perfect, but I, it at least, you know, has, a, has its place, I think. All right. And it, this is good. Um, yeah, feel free to ask questions as you come up with them. So we're going to talk about, you know, what the disease, you know, how many people have the disease kind of currently, um, native elders, 
with Alzheimer's, dementia, or memory problems. So these are people that um, have been diagnosed. Uh, this, these numbers were taken from the uh, Title VI needs assessment. Um, and we found that eight, about 8% 8 of elders are diagnosed with Alzheimer's, dementia, memory problems. And you know, of the people that, that took the assessment, 3% um, were caregivers of someone diagnosed with dementia, memory problems, or Alzheimer's disease. So we can, we can look at this in a few ways and we can say, okay, well, maybe it's not such a big, um, big risk for, for the native populations. Maybe it's not such a big thing that we're dealing with, but you know, I, I think that that may be not the most true statement. So we could also say that, gosh, you know, 89% of people are not diagnosed with, um, with Alzheimer's dementia. Maybe there's, there's some promotions we can do around, you know, getting people diagnosed and learning what the, the symptoms are and getting people to the doctor to maybe make, make that diagnosis. And then um, if we go into the next slide, we can dig into a little deeper about some, you know, some of the other risk factors that I pulled out from the Title VI needs assessment. So same group of, of people um, that were involved in that, that first little pie chart. Now we have three more pie charts explaining you know, who they are. So we look at this first one is age. Um, we have about 50, a little over 50% of the people are between 55 and 69 years. And what do we know? Risk doubles every five years after age 65. So we have, um, you know, a, a good chunk of, of people are uh, maybe a, a little bit of a less risk of an age category that completed the assessment. So, you know, the other half are, um, you know, about 30%, 70 to 79, about 13%, 80 plus years. Um, which, which is really good because it's, it's also showing that there's a lot that we can still do to prevent um, these memory related diseases from occurring. And then we look at the, the body mass index, which um, shows that, you know, about 44% of people are obese, 33% are overweight. So that that could show, you know, potentially some, some of these elders as they age might be of increasing risk from for dementia because they're they're already getting that age you know risk factor now they're they've got this you know obese overweight risk factor and then let, let's take a look at the the nutritional risk um so you know good nutritional status most people in your know, half are at a good nutritional status um, some are at moderate nutritional risk and 21% are at high nutritional risk. So uh, even though, you know, it's great that half of the people are, are really doing well, um, there's, there's a lot that can be done to reduce the risk of, you know, nutrition related diseases. First of all, like, you know, hypertension, um, diabetes, obesity with this, um, of focusing on this nutritional risk. And then also um, that of course all plays into your risk of dementia. So, um, you know, pretty, pretty interesting. Some of the, the interventions and, you know, just kind of shows how important traditional foods are because a lot of uh, what can be done um, will, will really help the person overall with their nutritional risk with other, you know, health benefits. And then with these um, Alzheimer's and dementia and other memory related disorders. All right, let's move on. So we've, we've talked a bit about, um, you know, uh, the brain, we've talked about, you know, dementia risk factors, a little bit about, you know, the, the native um, elder population. And then we'll talk about some of this sort of the, the broad kind of diets, nutrition advice um, that um, 
that's out there. So, you know, the Mediterranean diet is something that has been uh, long promoted for general health and, and also brain health. So um, that Mediterranean diet, you eat lots of vegetables, eat lots of fruits, eat lots of whole grains, beans, um, and other nuts, you low fat, fat-free dairy, fish, poultry, non-tropical vegetable oils. So uh, non-tropical vegetable oils, um, tropical vegetable oils would be like coconut oil, palm oil, and those are really high in um, saturated fats. So you, you know a vegetable oil is high in saturated fats when it's a solid at room temperature. So that's, that's a good way to gauge. Butter, high in saturated fat, right? Solid at room temperature. Um, but other vegetable oils are liquid at room temperature. So that's kind of what you're, you're wanting to get. So have olive oil, avocado oil, other vegetable sunflower oils are all, you know, lower in the, in those fats. So non-tropical vegetable oils, that's what I'm meaning there. Um, that's I already mentioned. You limit added sugar, sugary beverages, limit sodium, highly processed food, refined carbohydrates. So those cakes and cookies and all that that are so delicious, we just want to limit those. Um, you limit your saturated fats. You know, I, I talked a little bit about that with the vegetable oils and then limit your fatty and processed meats. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Let's look at another um, recommended diet. So this is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension or the, the DASH diet. So the DASH diet is, um, has been um, used medically for, for a long time, uh, usually with, with patients that do have hypertension, which we know is, is a modifiable risk factor. So this dietary approach, very similar to the Mediterranean diet, right? We have fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fat-free, low-fat dairy products, lean meats like fish and poultry, nuts, seeds, dry beans, peas, vegetable oils, and then we limit sodium. This one, you know, we say 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams a day. By the way, the 2,300 milligrams a day is your recommended um, sodium intake, of just kind of for the general population. Um, saturated fats, you limit sweets, limit sugar sweetened beverages, and high fat dairy products. So the the two diets, you know, when we put it like this, they, they really seem pretty similar. Eating a lot of the same things, we're limiting a lot of the same things. And then let's go on to the, the next slide. All right, so we're looking at now nutrition, nutrients in traditional foods. We, we know from the beginning, right, there's so many different uh, traditional foods out there and there's a lot of different nutrients that are, that are involved. So we're just kind of taking a broad strokes approach here with this slide, we're saying, oh, nutritional foods are high in potassium. They're high in um, your good fats. They're high in those complex carbohydrates. They're high in fiber. They're low in sodium, unhealthy saturated fats, simple carbohydrates and added sugars. So what do we see here? We, we see that traditional foods are really closely aligned with the other, you know, Mediterranean diet, DASH diet recommendations. So, you know, wonderful. It's, it's a great fit to, you know, help improve brain health and your overall health. All right, next slide. And we'll look at some, you know, brain healthy traditional food. Um, we have, you know, thinking about vegetables, corn, squash, pumpkin, um, ulu, or, or breadfruit in Hawaiian. Um, then we have fruits. You, know, you all mentioned a, a whole bunch of berries um, earlier. Apples, it's another great one. Whole grains, right? We have wild rice, quinoa, buckwheat. Um, wild rice is, is pictured there. Uh, Protein-rich foods, there's... Uh, fish, lean meats, eggs, that's all been mentioned. And um, so salmon, walleye, bison, caribou. Um, I have a picture of muktuk um, on the, the very top. It's a native Alaskan. 
um, and it, it's whale. Um, and then the, the bottom picture there is, is called poi. So it's a native Hawaiian dish uh, made from a taro that, that's been mashed up. Um, so yeah, nuts, seeds, we have pinion, tepary beans, which I know someone mentioned as their favorite food. Um, and then those, uh, those good monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats from oils and foods. So, you know, seal oil is really great. Avocado oil, a sesame oil are all, um, you know, excellent, you know, uh, foods that, that are really, you know, brain healthy, really um, kind of in line with those Mediterranean diets and DASH diet and other recommendations. And this is just a, a very short, very short list. There's a, a lot of other traditional foods that, that haven't been mentioned that also have uh, great benefits. But we'll go into the, the next slide. All right, so um, let me explain a little bit about um, the slide. So I know there's there's kind of a lot going on um, and we're not looking at it too much in detail. So, so don't worry there. Um, the ones in that reddish color are more of your traditional meats, right? There's beef, lean and USDA, chicken um, are all in the red. I think there's there's another rogue red there, but um, yeah, those three are what we're looking at for. The ones in the blue, buffalo, caribou, elk, moose, rabbit, um, those are all, you know, traditional foods. And, um, you know, we're just going to, we're really going to compare that first one and that um, last one. So the first one is lean ground beef. Um, and then the last one is rabbit. So we're looking at 17.7% you know, um, of protein in the, the beef versus 21.8% protein in the chicken. So, or in the, in the rabbit. So we know, you know, looking at this, it's possible there's um, a little bit more protein in the rabbit than in that, um, lean ground beef that, that people think are really so high in protein. And we actually, you know, looking at, at the protein graph, we see that lean ground beef has the lowest protein content of, of all the foods. Um, and then we'll, we'll jump over to the, the next graph, uh, which is the fat one. Again, looking at that, that first one, lean ground beef has 20.7% fat. And then we look at the rabbit, 2.3% fat. That's a huge difference. Um, we know we want to make sure we're, we're putting, you know, good fats into our body and, and staying away from, from some of those bad fats, um, saturated fats and whatnot that, that could be found in beef. So, you know, we learned that, gosh, comparatively, rabbit has uh, really, you know, good amount of protein, a low amount of fat, and then beef has a okay amount of protein and a really high amount of fat. So, you know, we see across the board, right, that the traditional um, foods, uh, traditional meat sources are all very high in protein and are all, you know, very low in, in fats. So uh, definitely, um, hopefully shows you all that that you know the traditional foods are uh, indeed very healthy choices. All right, next slide. Okay, so I want to I want to hear from you all again, and I want to know, you know, what benefits have you experienced from your traditional foods? So I've been just talking about the nutrition benefits of traditional foods, but we know there's so many more benefits beyond uh, beyond nutrition. I think just one of the comments that we had from Margaret King was being from Wisconsin in the Midwest, it would be great to have a statistic on deer venison too. Oh, yes, Margaret. Yes, I'm sorry I, I left that off. 
Um, but yeah, I can I can try to work and, and get you some information on venison. All right. Okay. Um, and then if you want to click the, the next button. So here, here's kind of a, a quick list and I, I definitely still want to hear, you know, more of, of what you have to say. Oh, good. Jessica's responded. Um, connection to culture, learning how to take care of foods, prepare, store them. Uh, being able to give items to traditional ser services and ceremonies, uh, give to those, um, give to those family time with your family while gathering or hunting, fishing, etc. Yes, I love it. There's so many things. Um, that was a, a beautiful response, Jessica. And give to family in need. Um, yeah, and that is, you know, a lot of what I've found too, you know, the benefits of traditional foods, right? Where um, there's a connection to culture and your cultural identity. Um, and that that's hugely important. Your, um, you know, it affects your quality of, of life. You know, not only are you getting, you know, the nutrients you need and maybe uh, feeling a little better, being able to do more things, right? You're, you're really kind of connecting um, with your food and culture in, in a different way that can really affect your quality of life, spiritual connection, um, ceremonies, and you know, traditional foods are definitely a big part of that. A link to the land. Uh, Jessica, you mentioned, you know, going out and um, gathering, you know, fishing, hunting, um, that all really kind of connects you to your, your place as well. And the, you know, the animals that you're with, the, the plants that you're with, um, your, your family there. Um, you know, it, it helps bring in, in dignity and preserves traditions. And then, uh, you know, connects to your community as well. You know, you mentioned Jessica, your, your family and uh, connecting to them and, uh, you know, larger uh, community as well. And then Margaret, yeah, you mentioned uh, trading, right? And community preservation. So that's another, other really huge um, benefits of traditional foods. All right, we can, we can go on to the next slide. All right, so we're, we're oh, okay. Tani says, um, passing down cultural practices to the next generation through preparing and eating traditional foods at family gatherings. Yes, I love it. You know, it's so important for those younger generations to, to get this knowledge. And then you're, you're having a great intergenerational activity there, um, getting everyone together. So, hi. All right, so on this slide, we're, we're bringing it back to the, to the elders that we've been, been learning about through the presentation. So. Um, you know, we learned how much of them you know, currently have dementia, uh, some of the risk factors, and now we're going to look at, you know, are elders participating in these cultural practices that include traditional food, music, and customs? And, you know, oh, about 30% say no. You know, they're not, nobody's participating in these kinds of traditions and customs. Um, and we know that that can be an issue, right? Because we've just talked about the huge benefits of, of doing so. Um, you know, half are doing, you know, some of the time they do, but, but not always. And just about 20% are, are seem more involved with a traditional food, music and customs. So that, that means there's really a great opportunity to get the elders a little more involved in, um, in these cultural practices and to, to maybe you know, learn, learn what it's like in your community. I, I know a lot of you all do have the Older Americans Act Title VI program and you have these needs assessments as specific for your community. So, um, I encourage you all to, to take a look and um, 
find out what's what's going on in your community and and learn a little bit more about why are the elders participating? Why aren't they participating? Maybe uh, they need transportation or um, or you know some other tangible help that that could allow them to participate. All right, uh, next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit more about um, how we can support ourselves and our communities in uh, these traditional foods and eating these traditional foods and in um, helping to you know, preserve our, our brain health. So just individual, you, know, you can try to, to eat traditional foods often. Um, you can learn more about traditional foods and and brain health. You can, for your community, you can become a dementia friend. So you know, I, I put a, a link there to the IA Squared um, Dementia Friends page. But they have a really, really great resources and information on, on how to become an, a dementia friend. And, um, and you can, you know, definitely participate in traditional ceremonies and events you know, encourage your elders to participate as well. Um, encourage your uh, youth to participate. So, you know, get, uh, participate yourself and, and get everyone, uh, you know, that's interested and able to participate. And then, um, you know, be, try to be involved in some of the intergenerational activities surrounding traditional foods. Um, so I think, Tani, that was, uh, that was what you were talking about, you know, passing down those cultural practices from one generation to the next. And, um, you know, it's, that really needs to be done in, in a, you know, a, a thoughtful manner. And it's so important to make sure that those traditions, and that culture um, carries on. And then um, you can encourage participation in the, um, so there's a new, uh, just rolled out this this week, uh, Native Farm and Garden Directory through um, ACL through the um, you know Office of, of Older Indians, and um, it's a quick you know it's for any American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian farmers or gardeners any size. So it's just a really quick you know two page application, just asking a little bit about contact information, what's grown. Um, that's it. And then you'll, um, that organization will be included in a directory of uh, native farmers and gardeners. So, um, you know, for first iteration will we'll probably just be a printed directory and working on getting a, a interactive map. So, you know, that's something that, that you can really do to encourage, um, that you can do to encourage, you know, native farmers and, and gardeners to um, be in the directory and to help, you know, increase um, their sales and you know increase the support of of people buying these locally produced um, foods. And then with the larger society, right? You can you can advocate. So advocate for more traditional foods and your meal program and the community commodity foods programs. Um, you can um, participate in, in research if the opportunity arises on health benefits and traditional foods and, you know, getting, um, getting more information, right? So we're not, not have stuck trying to, um, with like with the BMI, you know, it's, it's geared towards a different audience at a different time. So um, getting your, your voice and your feedback in these um, research activities are, are really helpful. You can also comment on the proposed regulations. Um, there's you know, all different proposed regulations that are, are coming out. Um, right now, the Older Americans Act uh, regulations is in the open comment period. If any of you do you uh, work with the Older Americans Act programs, I, I really encourage that you uh, comment on those proposed regulations. Um, you can do that until August 15th. And then, you know, write, call, or meet with some of your government representatives, your tribal, state, and federal representatives. All right, uh, next slide. 
and then um, you know share share information. There's a lot of really great resources out there uh, talking about traditional foods and health benefits of traditional foods. So I just included two examples uh, that I thought were really good. Uh, the first one is from Lucian Provolof Islands Association, and they they did well they. They did a bunch of stuff. They, they did some nutrition facts, um, information on their traditional foods, and they also did some nutri nutrient spotlight for, um, this one is protein, talking about the uh, caribou meat. So, um, you know, looking at the comparison of protein in different meat sources, starting with hot dog, chicken nuggets, lunch meat, pot roast, caribou. So you can see, gosh, caribou has really good uh, protein content. I put a link there to, um, to their website. You can take a look at some of their other resources. And then um, the next one is a, a little poster from the First Nations Development Institute talking about nettles. So they have a, a few different um, posters that you can you can print, you can download on um, different traditional foods. So um, and there, there's really, you know, a lot out there. You can always connect with me if you're looking for some um, information and I can help you find it. All right, next slide. And then, you know, you can, you can also host some um, activities in your community. So we're, we'll take this intergenerational cooking class with traditional foods as an example. Right. There's um, so a lot of potential benefits. This cooking class, you're supporting healthy eating, right? You're supporting social connection. You're connecting people to your culture. Um, and then there's a little bit of physical activity involved, right? You, you have uh, often standing while you're cooking. If there's a, a gathering, hunting, fishing component that comes along with the cooking class, right? Even better. So we, with this, we see that the potential benefits are really varied and they really, um, you know, can, can help alleviate some of the uh, modifiable risk, a lot of the, mo the modifiable risk factors that we looked at earlier in the presentation. I put a, you know, if you need resources on here for you, or you need, you need someone that's going to cook, knows how to cook the food, you need the food, cooking supplies, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, there's um, definitely some things that you can do to prepare, but um, the benefits really come a long way. All right, next slide. Here's um, a few resources for you. I the first one is um, the brain anatomy, how the brain works. If you if you want to learn more into the science of the brain, um, and then yeah, I have a, uh, the next ones are are some really good traditional foods um, resources for you. And then the last one on is the Title VI needs assessment that I've been referring to. So you can take a look at that needs assessment. It's um, combined for, for elders all over the nation. All right, next slide. Uh, thank you everyone for, um, for participating today and I look forward to any questions you have. It looks like Melissa also wanted to adapt this presentation for her elders program in Milwaukee. So that's awesome. I think um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free. We were just going to touch base on some of our I squared stuff that we have going on. Um, and Marianne, if you don't mind just keeping an eye on the questions in case we need to answer anything. Um, so thank you again, Heidi, for a wonderful presentation. Um, 
We did also want to touch upon our series of six healthy food, healthy brain rack cards that we have done. This healthy eating focus message series includes information about nutrition and culturally relevant recipes. Um, these rack cards are a quick reference for community members to learn about the connection of eating healthy and brain health. Um, tribal meal delivery programs can incorporate weekly distribution for in-person and home delivered meals. Um, Heidi, actually, Heidi Robertson, our presenter, worked very closely with us in the development process of these rack cards. Um, so thank you again for your expertise, Heidi. Uh, these six rack cards include a general healthy food, healthy brain rack card, um, a My Native Plate Focus rack card, food swaps, nutrition labels, making changes and being active and to also um, like push the rack cards. They all have really good recipes on the back that um, we were really excited about. Um, and these, yes, Margaret, these rack cards are available. They are on our website. We'll make sure that we have that available for you. Um, and you are able to reach out to us. Uh, we do have printing stipends, so if you need them, to be sent to your communities, we can send those to your communities as well. Um, and then before you all leave today, I wanted to provide a few ways that you can participate with I Squared. We're working to put a, to put together a library of stories, including the perspectives of American Indian Alaska Native elders and their caregivers about memory loss, dementia, caregiving, and various taboos and misconceptions that surround memory loss and dementia in dementia native communities. Um, it is kind of similar to uh, Humans of New York or um, the recently released Project 562 by Matika Wilbur, um, specifically focusing on caregivers and those affected by memory loss or dementia in native communities. And, Anyone who does participate, we will be providing a $30 gift card to Amazon or Walmart. Um, so you can learn more by scanning the QR code or using um, these bit.ly like website links. And yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Ann, I think. Gonna... Yeah, we just want to say uh, thank you, everybody, again for being here today. Um, you can always follow along with us as we continue. Um, if we have anything coming out in the future, we'll be posting about that either on our Facebook or social media, um, as well as on our e news. Um, so, uh, again, thank you all. And um, yeah, we'll hopefully see you all again in the future. Dave, did you want to do a, a prayer, an ending prayer? Sure. Um, I'll give a short charity benediction as I frequently do. We know away we we are we are you're out there and we're down here. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again, Heidi. Thank you, thank you Dave. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending and thanks IA Squared for having me. Of course. Thank you all.